Are you ready? Yes. All right. Well, sorry for the delay. Let's get started. It's great to see everybody here and online. We've got a bunch of people here. Um, and uh, it's, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. I hope so. I, I like talking about this stuff and thinking about it. And I think for all of us, it's really important um, to do a more thorough job of thinking about the bioethics behind the work that we're doing. Not because, not just because NIH is really demanding it of us, but because these conversations are happening on Twitter and Facebook and like with our families over Thanksgiving. And it's important that we understand how to articulate what we're doing in that sense, not just to NIH, but I think also kind of in the court of public opinion. So I think we're really fortunate to have Mark and Paul and Lauren here. And um, can I remove the blur in the background? Yeah. Um, how's that? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay. So okay. without further ado, thank you guys very much for coming. Well, much appreciated. And, and thanks for inviting us. What we want to do is build uh, a bioethics core for FES, right? And, and BME more broadly, but, but especially you guys. And uh, fortunately, uh, I'm, by the way, I'm the chair of the Department of Bioethics here at Pace. My background is analytic philosophy, but what I've done for my career really is clinical bioethics, it's research ethics. And um, actually had some personal interest in FES as uh, my godfather was paralyzed um, as a 16 year old at Leary Catholic High School playing football uh, back in 1962. Um, and, you know, I only knew him as Uncle Tony, the, the yeah. tetraplegic. And so, um, and we always thought about the possibilities of like, are you ever walked in or whatever? But, and he died back, you know, in 2007, I think, but uh, lived a long time post injury. Um, and did it mainly by avoiding doctors who, of whom he was there. And anyway, we want to build a core. The kind of work that you all are doing is critically important and it's loaded with value laden dimensions, whether it's underpinnings or eventual implications or interesting social questions or legal questions. And, you know, we, we think that in different ways, um, not because we've got all the answers, but because we spend our time, this is kind of what we do, we can, you know, complement your work and maybe in some ways make some of your submissions a little more appealing, a little stronger, but also, you know, hopefully engender some really good critical thinking about um, the bigger picture kind of things, which sometimes as an engineer is hard to, you know, you get so dialed in that, that you go granular, right? Um, so anyway, um, thank you for inviting us and we're really looking forward to engagement with you. I'm gonna hand things over to a couple of real neuroethicists um, I, I dabble sort of, and I'm interested, but Paul and Lauren, uh, they do neuroethics and have been doing it for a number of years and they're really good at what they do. So they're going to give a sense of a, a little overview, a little flavor, uh, and then open it up for conversation. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I'm Paul Ford and I am uh, at the Cleveland Clinic for the last 20 years. I did my undergraduate in math and computer science and then realized that at the engineering school, people weren't talking about the ethics. And so then went to graduate school, the philosophy, found the medical ethics, and then finally found my way back to the high tech when the deep brain stimulation group got me involved early on. And uh, when they were innovating, I continued to innovate and meeting with patients, helping them and doing a lot of uh, different things. It's an exciting time to be in neuroethics because there is an increasing capacity building right now and an increased opportunity to help um, with research, but also do our own research. So finally, as a field, we're training people like, like Lauren that has the skills now um, and uh, has come into the, the, the field um, to have social science skills and other research skills to actually move things forward. So this is exciting. We have a, uh, a neuroethics fellow. We have a neuroethics fellow at the clinic uh, starting in July who specializes in ethics and pain. So we're going to continue to build this And this uh, this core for the uh, FES Center is just another example of both services and then opportunities for collaboration and doing things. So it's, it's really a blend. So we'll go over some of those. You can see the Brain Initiative. 
they have really highlighted that neuroethics is to be integrated. And they learned a lesson from the genetics and LC folks on something they didn't want. They didn't want a whole bunch of ethics projects thinking about genetics, yeah. like LC ended up doing, but they wanted neuroethics projects that are integrated and part of the real neuroscience going on, not the science fiction, you know, the, the real bread and butter. Okay. Well, sorry, I was supposed to introduce him. We're for Sally and Ford. I was Good on the call and you did a great job. Thank you. I will introduce you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's been, uh, and I'm still cognizant that there's somebody here that's trying to experiment. What is my like capacity to live for, for continuing to talk despite the uh, abstraction? We'll see what that is. But uh, but really, the, the net is very wide the brain initiative, but that faded an important part of the uh, uh, the whole enterprise right from the beginning. That ethics is part of the way we design, develop, carry out, and put forward. The the science, the application of the science, it's it's everywhere. So um, you know, strictly you think about the brain initiative and that they list at least three ways in which the uh, the research um, integrating research, there's ethics advice right at the beginning that 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 you can get about design and ethical implications downstream of how you do it. Um, one of the greatest compliments I had was one from our one of our DBS surgeons who said that I'm not a person who tends to say no, you can't ethically do it, but rather if you want to do it, here are the ways that you can do it in an ethical manner. Right? Here are the solutions. So some of those ways that you're talking about aren't supportable, but here are some ways. Maybe it's too expensive for you. Maybe it's going to take too long. But this is the pathway. So research collaboration, unique opportunity to explore the ethical nature of uh, what, what's being done. So the neuroethicist in the first part helps with, with helping you design and, and advises, consults with you. The second, they're an investigator along with you. Um, and then uh, um, they, they, there may be parallel studies that they, that they can do alongside you. That doesn't really relate it to your research, but can help them out and you can share uh, research uh, um, participants. So the, the roadmap itself uh, talks about the informed consent process. Every single uh, clinical trial in the, the brain initiative gets a ethics discussant review. So anyone who submitted will have seen for the good or bad has had uh, probably some comments about the ethics session. And, and if the consent process is, uh, are things ethically appropriate, well-informed, they're really focusing on this end of trial, post-trial responsibilities. Um, Hunter uh, sent me a, an email ahead of time. I know he's online virtually um, and uh, was hoping we would talk about some of those because he's seen that history that, that, uh, that we need to pay attention to. You know, psychosocial risks are often, uh, um, the, you know, really forefront or even those because when you're talking particularly with the, the brain itself, there are multiple pathways that can affect multiple kinds of things. So you, you may have effects that are unintended. Um, we wanted to, to get some of your ideas today on, on how we can collaborate most effectively um, and also to kind of brainstorm that and, and as a jumping off point, we wanted to share some research that, uh, that I did starting in my, my postdoc uh, in collaboration with some investigators in the FDS Center that really focused on this issue of post-study responsibilities, um, which I think is, is an issue that has come to mind a, a number of times and is one that, that really Kind of outlines the scope of your responsibilities as an investigator. If if these are indefinite, it may become really unfeasible to do this this kind of research. Uh, so we need to kind of circumscribe some of those responsibilities. Um, there, there's guidance out there around developing detailed protocols. Uh, you need to clarify what post study follow up you have in place for your study participants. Uh, and there's attentiveness to the idea that there might be some physical and psychological risks that research participants face at the end of a study or after a, a study is actually terminated in terms of its former proto formal protocol. So Lauren, before you go further, can you say a little bit about your background and how you got here? Oh, sure. So uh, my, my academic background is actually in law. Um, I, I, I studied law at Case Western Reserve University. I mean, did a master's in bioethics at the, at the same time. 
Um, at the time, I, I never imagined doing doing research uh, until about my second year of law school when I, I began to integrate into the neurotic program at the Cleveland Clinic through a series of internships. I was interested in, in policy, health policy, uh, but then decided that I actually wanted to do empirical research, that we can't answer questions like, what do we owe research participants in these studies without actually talking to them about their expectations, their experiences being in research protocols like this. So I, in my final year of law school, was writing my first NIH grant, one of the um, NIH Brain Initiative uh, F32 proposals um, to try to get some postdoctoral uh, research training to fill in gaps. We don't train lawyers um, in empirical research methods. Uh, so I knew I had to get some skills outside of law school to be able to do some work in this space. Um, so I was one of the first recipients of, of the Brain Initiative F32, um, focused on, on neuroethics specifically. Um, so I've been trying to out define how we, what kinds of methods we need to train people in um, to do this kind of research, what these career paths can look like, how do you train somebody with a law background uh, to be able to contribute to this area of research? So I'm, I'm invested both in um, developing more training opportunities like that um, and in this area of research more broadly. Uh, but the, this issue of what happens at the end of the study was somewhat interesting from a regulatory perspective, in part because it's not fully clear whether it's within an IRB's jurisdiction or whose jurisdiction, who is responsible for oversight of what happens after a study is complete. And since I, I began to tackle this topic in, in 2017, uh, there have been a number of, of new, news articles that have come out focused on this issue that really identify that we've been under attentive to some of the needs of, of research participants, particularly if a company that develops a device uh, goes out of business. Um, so a bit less focused on the research side and more focused on the commercial side, generally speaking. Um, and nature in particular has been attentive to this. There was a, a recent article um, that, that uh, focuses a bit more on this issue from, from December of 2022. So my F32 uh, proposal tried to look at this both from a regulatory perspective uh, and I, I decided I needed some qualitative methods to do this research effectively. Uh, so I, I was proposing to get some training in, in modified grounded theory um, in order to try to characterize what the experience of being in a study like this is like. And this, I felt, could help us get a little bit closer to understanding what expectations research participants have when they agree to be a part of studies uh, like clinical trials of deep brain stimulation. Um, and I, I also examined some of the regulatory side of this as well as what I could figure out about current practices uh, in, in research protocols, which was, which was one of the hardest steps in this process. The reason I was interested in exit from brain implant research is that there, there are risks uh, that we were more aware of uh, that, that could, could be um, uh, side effects of neurostimulation devices that we may be able to characterize in research like this. And we know that there are some devices that could affect a, a participant's decision-making capacity, um, although most of them won't affect whether a participant can make ongoing decisions about uh, their participation in a trial. But we also know that there are risks when we remove some of these devices. I, in the protocol, we've planned to have the device explanted at the end of the study. Uh, we know, especially with deep brain stimulation, that some of those risks are actually increased at the point of explant, um, there's an increased risk of hemorrhage, for example, and, and deep brain stimulation. So these are risks that, that participants may be a bit less attentive to when they're enrolling in a study. If they're not thinking about what might happen years down the line. There also may be uncertain risks with longer term stimulation if a participant decides to keep the device in. And sometimes that's not well characterized, particularly if we don't have long term follow up data on, our, on a new or investigational device. And then there are burdens that, that we can anticipate related to follow up care uh, to maintain devices, battery replacements, uh, or if a, a participant is going to have a device explanted after they've exited from a research protocol, then there are costs and burdens associated with that explant that, that may not fall into the, the study's budget itself. So there's some FDA regulation that, that was relevant to this. Most, most of the answers to my questions weren't going to be found in regulation. Um, but we, we do, FDA does define 
some of the investigators' responsibilities to maintain participants' safety and welfare. Uh, they, they, the FDA requires uh, an investigator to supervise device use and to engage in the safety and monitoring and adverse event reporting that you're all very familiar with, uh, as well as they specifically mention in, in regulation that there's responsibility to oversee disposition of the device upon the trial's completion or termination. And that can be a bit confusing if, if you would expect a participant to keep the device implanted longer term. Some of these responsibilities may extend years and may extend beyond the, the actual duration of the study. So my question was, are, are there responsibilities that, that end um, when a trial ends or are there some that continue beyond that? Um, and how should we address those ethical obligations? One of my steps was to, to try to figure out exactly what current or active research protocols at the time, I think this is published in 2018. Um, what are those, oh, 2020, excuse me, uh, but the recent, the review was conducted in 2018 and 2019. I was trying to figure out what protocols that were, what uh, DBS protocols that were active at that time, clarified about what the plan was at the end of the trial. And what was in the study protocol? Were there exit procedures that were somewhat standardized across DBS trials? Or did it vary from study to study? Um, I, I debated asking investigators to voluntarily give me the, the section of their protocol uh, that addresses exit um, and different approaches to the, and ultimately decided to look at um, publications of these procedures. And, and I found, as, as we probably expect with publications of study findings, that there was a lot of variation on what was published about exactly what happened at the end of the, the trial. Uh, what, what exit procedures were in place. For example, was there an exit interview where each participant met with a member of the research team uh, and discussed their experience in the study, discussed different options potentially regarding device removal or continued use of a device, uh, or was something about explant pre-planned and something that was dictated at the time that a participant enrolled in a research study. My concern as an ethicist, when I see a lot of the variability in, in what research practices are at least disclosed more widely with respect to exit, is that if there's, if there's quite a bit of variation in the procedures we have in place, and particularly if there's variation in some of the options that participants have regarding surgical removal of the devices or post-trial use of these devices, as an ethicist, that worries me about potential uh, justice concerns and uh, justice considerations. Um, that, that we would want to keep in mind. We don't want the options a participant has uh, to depend uh, just on kind of which trial it was they happened to enroll in based on physical proximity or geographical proximity. Uh, we'd want to make sure it's based on a, a kind of clinically sound justification. Um, and most importantly, that, that these uh, practices and, and procedures are clearly disclosed as participants enroll in a research study. So then the next uh, portion of this research was, was the um, qualitative research that I mentioned. I really wanted to understand uh, what people who have exited from research studies or who are in the process of exiting from um, research studies that involve brain implants, uh, what their experiences are like and what they expected when they first enrolled in a study, uh, what they expected at the time that they actually exited from a research protocol. And so I, I undertook this project um, well, can I answer your question about that last study? Yeah, you please. Um, did you hear back from any of the research study directors after the fact about, yeah. like, did they know that they were sort of falling short or all over the board at least? No, no, I, ha I haven't received any, any outreach from people who published findings from DBS research. Um, th this was, was just a literature review. I hear you. Another, There's another no way to like it. So there was no attempt from this study to sort of raise oh, the ball. Contact each. No, no. So I ultimately, and I, and I included some international studies in this as well. I ultimately decided to see what's what's published about it. Um, I I worked with NIH at one point to see if they wanted to ask for people to share information about study exit, and it became kind of practically unfeasible within the scope of a three year postdoc to get to get as much information directly from investigators. Okay. My, my hope actually is that particularly as, as clinicaltrials.gov increasingly requires people to share research protocols, that there's going to be more comfort with sharing your research protocol as time goes on. But at the time I, I did this, that was not being implemented. I mean, people were somewhat protective of 
of exactly what their protocol says about study exit or follow up care. Um, unfortunately, I'm hoping that will change over time. Yeah, no one yeah, wants to get realize they're on the short end of the stick. Yeah, yeah, I think it's an interesting thing to discuss, especially with with this area of research with training in it is that we, we do have to build trust in each other and, and kind of in the multidisciplinary collaboration we need to, to do this. I ended up relying mostly on on working with researchers who knew me and knew that I, I wasn't trying to scrutinize uh, their work in order to get get data and, and specifically to ask participants about their experiences being in um, in research like this. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So grounded theory is a is a qualitative research methodology that, that's really appropriate when you don't know a lot about a specific experience. So when I was thinking about what the right set of qualitative methods would be to use, is it a survey? Could I just survey um, 800 research participants? Um, I decided not to do that because when I first uh, was interested in this research, um, there was really nothing published about what it feels like to exit from a research study. Um, there, there weren't even some of the news articles that I just showed you published at that time. So um, modified grounded theory um, tries to understand in an, it, it frames open-ended questions uh, rather than a structured interview where you might be focused on, I don't know, psychological distress somebody may experience or anything in particular like that. It tries to focus on open-ended questions that will allow you in an open-ended way to ask somebody about their experiences, their motivations. Um, the idea is that you can build a theory with, uh, with some of the qualitative data that you collect. Um, I called it modified grounded theory because I didn't expect to develop in this postdoc research a theory of all people's experiences in research like this. Uh, but I'm growing from you know, sociology and other disciplines to try to characterize what this experience would be like. Yeah. Just, uh, uh, so these are these are the interviews with patients, right? These are my the interviews with the patients, correct? Yes, yes, okay. with people who exited so, from these protocols. Let's find out one thing. I, I've never programmed major, major depression or stroke, mm -hmm. but I did help out programming obsessive compulsive disorder and patients and one or two of chronic pain. Yeah. Now I'm a neurologist and mostly program ET, a central tremor and Parkinson and dystonium and forensic brain. And that's like slammed down, works out very well. So it's 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 difficult for those people to exit, right? Mm -hmm. But my experience with OCD is not as good as uh, what my experience with Parkinson is it and, and if you look at the literature, it is not as powerful either. So um, would it be different perspective for somebody who is exiting the trial or something which is an kind of kind of effect versus a robust effect? That's a great question. And I, I ultimately couldn't get a large enough number of participants from each of these uh, trials that had ended. Um, to be able to make those comparisons, but that was that was something I was really interested in when I when I thought about this. And actually, I will say of the four uh, trials that I tried to recruit from, um, I recruited the fewest participants from the study of DBS for OCD. Um, that was the there hardest. Not many, anyways. Yeah, yeah, it's a small group, and they were most likely to tell me, "No, I don't want to talk to you about this." Uh, when I, when I was calling people asking if they'd like. Part to is there OCD too, right? Because. <laughs> they have OCD, so Perfect. they don't want to come out of their routine. Yeah, and you are asking them question is not in their routine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I found that that so, so I had to have an investigator who trusted me enough to to reach out to people who had been in studies like this, uh, and I had to try to track down people who had been out of a research protocol for different amounts of time. Some people were just exiting and that, that was, I, I had the best recruitment from the study of uh, deep brain stimulation and post-stroke hemiparesis, um, in part because they were still kind of connected to the research team. I still had good contact information to try to recruit them as a postdoc. Uh, for the other three studies uh, that had, that had uh, finished uh, years before I was attempting to recruit participants, I had less luck getting in contact with with them for these trials. And that was one barrier to, to doing this kind of research. 
and, and we can talk more particularly about the major depression one because that is a special case yeah. now with the consent monitor consent support for that trial and when it was uh discontinued so I, I don't major want to depression is around for quite a longer time than the other three right it's yeah. so so, so but there was a disruption in the research itself so. Yeah, that was a study that, that terminated early. And, and one other difference to point out in, in the clinical trials I was recruiting from, um, this stroke study is different in the sense that there was no option for participants to keep the device implanted. Explant was a planned part of that study protocol. Um, but it generally in modified theory, you're, you're not trying to generalize, you're, you're not actually going to be able to make broad hypotheses or characterizations of different uh, research populations in a study like that. And this may be hard hard to see for people here. I, I just wanted to give you a sense of the of the I think it was 40 participants I tried to recruit. I was only able to get 16 people to agree to tell me about their experiences being in a, a protocol like this. Um, uh, 16 is a tiny number in quantitative research, but for a qualitative study that's meant to get a first sense of what this experience is like. Um, it's enough that we that we started when it comes to qualitative research. Um, I'll mention that that uh, there were there was some variation in how long it had been uh, since participants were in uh, the study protocol since the, the trial ended. Um, this was generally a fairly well educated uh, sample of, of former research participants. Um, and I'll also mention I, I got almost an even breakdown between uh, participants who still had the device implanted at the time that I interviewed them. That was uh, seven of my 16 participants who still had the device implanted, and then nine had it explanted, including as a plan part of, of the um, DBS for, for post-stroke hemiparesis study. And there was also variation in whether participants described whether they um, experienced improvement um, from, from the device, experienced any direct benefit from the device. So I'll share some of the themes. I, I know this is kind of an abbreviated version of, of this talk, which I, I was recently asked to present some of these findings to, um, to researchers at the Shirley Ryan um, Ability Lab in, in Northwestern since they have been grappling with some of these questions about studies like this. I found that in general, in a way that probably aligns with most of our expectations, people were thinking on a fairly short-term basis when they were enrolling in trials like this. Um, most of the time when I ask people, how much did you think about the end of the study? Um, they said, I really didn't think about that at all. I was taking it one step at a time, one day at a time. I was struggling with symptoms of uh, depression, and I wasn't thinking about my long-term future at the point that I decided to be in a study like this. Um, so they, they told me that they, they generally didn't really think about some of the long-term concerns that I kept asking them about over and over again. Um, I found that they also described having some incomplete understanding of, of more technical details of, of the research protocol. Um, some people who described that they had a background in science said that they, they were able to understand a bit more of the research protocol, but still they were just thinking about the idea that something was going to be implanted in their brains, and they weren't thinking about, about longer term implications of that. Some of them were very honest with me in a way that might upset an IRB and said, I actually really didn't read every part of that giant stack of papers that I was given when I enrolled in this study, uh, but I did read the important parts. Um, don't worry. I found that people described that being in a research study was the best way to learn about what that experience is like, and that it, it was a fairly experiential learning process. Um, they said that they, uh, this one participant told me that uh, she told the, the study coordinator that she actually started to understand the protocol once she went through each step that was described in laborious detail with an ethicist supervising uh, the consent process. And, and she was starting to understand uh, what each, each step of the protocol actually meant. A number of participants described some uncertainty about what would happen longer term with the device. Um, uh, they especially described uncertainty about financial responsibility um, would at some point they become financially responsible for follow-up care that they might need? Um, and did it did their financial responsibility depend on whether the device is explanted um, or remains implanted? Uh, and and I'll, I'll show you, um, I, I did find that this generally detracted, when there was more uncertainty that might detract from their experience of, of exiting from a research protocol. 
Uh, the, the decision about device removal is something that I was particularly interested in as a bioethicist, um, because I, I thought that this might be a hard decision for some participants. I think this was something that my own expectations as a researcher that were kind of some of the, the data that I actually um, uh, uh, acquired. Most people said this was a straightforward decision. Um, the device was either helping in a way that was was fairly clear to them or meaningful in their lives, uh, or it wasn't. Um, and the decision about whether to have it explanted was supported by the, the research team and the, the clinician investigators who were a part of that study. Um, one participant who already had a rechargeable uh, battery implanted said it was a completely straightforward decision to keep using the device uh, since it, it was helpful. Uh, there was one who who worried um, this was a participant in, in the study of, of deep brain stimulation for post-stroke hemiparesis, the Eden study, um, worried that having the device removed might mean that there would be a regression or, or that she would re-experience symptoms that she uh, had before the device was implanted. Um, and so she was worried about that regression there um, and progress she had made. Another participant uh, so that the device coming out really signified that the study was over and that there was something that they had to kind of process about that. Um, and particularly, they, they said it, that it, the idea of keeping it in made the, gave them continued hope that they would progress even if they hadn't seen much progress in their symptoms. Uh, and then there were some people who had become kind of apathetic to the device. It didn't help them. It's just a piece of hardware. There's a risk of infection. Get it out of me. Um, and they, they were not very attached to, to the device at that point. What I, I found really striking about this research, and, and I've had researchers approach me at, at, when I've discussed some of these findings at conferences, um, is really that there are important relationships formed um, throughout the research process. Um, that the, the relationships built with a, a research team really matter a lot to participants. And the exit from research can be psychologically difficult just because. It feels like there's something bittersweet about having accomplished something with this team of people, uh, but also the idea that you're not going to see them as regularly as you did while you were a part of a research protocol. And, and I think that people might underestimate just how important those, re those relationships can become to research participants. Uh, many people describe being in a research study like this as uh, similar to, to being in a full-time job, and the, the research personnel end up being like your coworkers. Um, at that job, and you can develop relationships. You want to know what happens, uh, uh, updates in their lives after leaving the research study. One more question. Yeah. Just wondering about your observation. What is something that I have been noticing? So, when it comes to Parkinson patients, um, I have we have two types of patients: right? those who have DBS and those who don't have DBS, and both types, like we follow on quite frequent basis. But those who have DBS, I feel personally that they are more close to us. Um, we know more about them and they know more about us and they want to know more about us. And vice versa, like, what does your daughter do? What does your son do? My daughter is getting married. I never have those discussions with somebody who don't have DBS. Have you noticed that, like somebody who allows you to put something in their brain and move around with it, are going to be more close to you? Definitely. So it is, no, seriously, right? Yeah, I mean, no, it's an important question, especially in the context of research. I think it, it matters a lot. Yeah. This is for general clinical care too, right? So I agree. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, for so them, it's the same thing. Like somebody is putting an electrode in their head and doing something, right? And I think there's something for that be a root indication or not. Yeah, I think there's something reciprocal about that too. I, I sit in in patient management conferences. I'm part of the, the committee that uh, determines patient selection in a clinical context. And there are times that clinicians on the DBS team describe that they become married to a patient once you implant. Oh, uh, yes. Um, so there also are these yeah. obligations that clinicians are taking on um, uh, responsibilities when you implant a device in a clinical context. In a research context, the only thing that's unexpected about this uh, is that this sounds a lot like a therapeutic relationship. Um, it doesn't have the kind of cold objective distance that people um, who aren't intimately a part of research like this might expect there to be in a relationship between a participant and, and 
or is it your hold it just you know I, I think if you want to get at this question there's a, some confounding factors right um, one of the confounding factors is a select obvious selection bias between the personality types or perhaps the set of symptoms for those who undergo DBS and those who don't I mean, you could I could postulate that those who undergo DBS may have less apathy because apathy kept some of those people who didn't uh, move forward, or maybe the disease state is slightly different, or maybe most of them are, are Parkinson's plus who don't, or, you know. So I think that's that's one aspect that it would be great, interesting to study. And it's similar for research. Those who agree to research may have a particular personality. Um, something that really struck me in uh, below the uh, the film that um, being human, no. Well, yeah, I, 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 I am human, right? Uh, struck me that when I saw the interactions on film between you and the research, there was a kind of striving together that that really okay. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm raising what I observed that that there was a mutuality and and a lot, a lot of times I want to talk about research participants really as subjects, but but that person was striving together with you as a true participant, and so I think that relationship is very different. But exploring what that means and what the right way to break up with a the patient then, right? Because they're part of family, they. What does it mean? And you know, what is the cost of that? Is that fascinating? Yeah, you know, we've actually, I've actually personally gone away from the strong research participants, so I call them research partners. Partners? I mean, that is, that's exactly, you know, with our previous, previous partner, our program, that's exactly what it is. There's a striving to that they are as much intellectually invested, uh, personally invested in the success of the research as we are. And, and I think that's so you use the term in publications too. I would use that term for yeah. yeah. You are? Yes. Yeah. But, but I think that it it shouldn't be used uh, casually or loosely. You know, but there are lots of research subjects or subjects, lots of our participants. But this kind of research with a lot of the work that you guys were doing in FES, you rely on their collaboration, right? Their partner, truly their partnership. So I don't know if you're I like that. Uh, I have to put their name on the paper. That's an interesting <laughs> one. That's a very interesting question. You're right. You know, it's true. Well, but, but that confidentiality is intended to protect the person. And like in the, the movie, I mean, the movie, the kind of publication. Yeah, right? That's true. And, and it seemed to me that they were willing and excited and interested. Oh, yeah. In contributing in that new way, and in fact, Lauren, one of the your research, were you going to talk with us? Uh, the panel with uh, the yeah. psychiatrist and um, yeah, I, I did include one participant who I interviewed as a part of this research, and I, I invited her to be a part of a panel. She wanted to share about her experience being in a um, study of DBS that was terminated early, um, and uh, kind of what she went through there. Um, and, and so she truly was partnering with me um, to, to describe that experience. At an academic conference. So in a, and the end, she, after her depression lifted because of the DVM, she went back and was in a PhD program. And so she was partnering. And it, it seemed like us that she was, we were respecting her academic and life experience by offering her a partnership in the panel that we're I will. So, uh, it's very interesting. Um, the other other uh, part to this is also what they did, their past life, right? My experience uh, is I work at UH, I work at GA, and I have been to many other institutes. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm ready. My experience in recruiting people for the research study from my private practice, be it at Hopkins or at Emory or at Case, I mean, at UH, uh, it's more difficult than recruiting someone from the VA. Veterans, you tell them that, listen, this is my study, would you do it? And mm -hmm. rarely they will say no. While in private, they would be 50%. I don't know what is literature. Yeah, I, I don't know that recruit um, literature specifically. And, and part of what I struggled with in, in doing this research was how do I generalize something from the experiences of these 16 participants? Um, what I, what I, I won't go through this and put you through uh, this entire figure, but I, I just wanted to mention that exactly what we're describing about these relational considerations, um, what I found is that what affected people's experiences being in research most was really the relationship formed with the research team, 
the communication that took place between research participants and members of the research team, uh, even if there was a lot of disappointment in uh, the, the amount of direct benefit a participant received from being in the research study, if, if that was a, if they had a shared sense of disappointment with the research team, I, I remember participants telling me the, the research team was just as disappointed as I was, that I didn't get more benefit from being a part of this study. I, and that helped them process the fact that the, the research was ending, the fact that they didn't, the, the disappointment of not getting benefit they may have hoped for, um, and adapting to life after being a part of a research study like this, um, and could enhance a sense of closure the other thing that, that really influenced that was the sense of, of appreciation, a kind of mutual appreciation uh, for each other, the, the sense that the research participant could express appreciation for the research team and maybe the study sponsor for, for their contributions as well. Um, and that, that that appreciation was reciprocal, that was expressed back to the participant. Um, the other thing that seemed to soften some of the, the um, psychological difficulties people faced at the end of the study was having some ongoing contact uh, with the research team, or at least a sense of what came from their contributions to a research project like this. Uh, so so I, I know that we were uh, running short on time. I developed some recommendations from, from this research project. Uh, what, what can be especially challenging in, in um, empirical bioethics research is how do I go from here are some experiences that people have to here are some recommendations for you about your ethical obligations. Um, I, I did uh, recommend that, that we emphasize more about some of the longer term considerations that people may want to think through with study participation. Um, we need to be clear about what options we're going to provide. Um, the scope of follow-up care that is provided in a, a research study. Uh, we need to separate some of the informed consent processes that relate more to, to explant and the end of the study um, and provide potentially some, some psychological support to participants uh, in, in some clinical trials where we might anticipate uh, different psychosocial risks. Um, and finally, with, with study exit, I provided some recommendations about creating opportunities for, for dialogue with research participants at the end of a study. And um, it seemed to be appreciated by those participants, both in creating a sense of closure, but also expressing appreciation for their contributions to research. Um, so I, I wanted to present this mostly as an example of, of uh, collaboration that, that you can have with a neuroethicist, research that can be conducted alongside a neuroethics trainee or, or a neuroethics researcher. Um, and I know we wanted to take at least some time, and we're getting close to the end of the hour, um, to discuss both how we can support your research and to get any of your ideas about how we can collaborate most effectively. Um, there is, I'll mention that there is a, now a, a neuroethical consideration section of your already long um, NIH uh, research protocols. Uh, so that's something that with the bioethics core we're, we're launching here. Uh, we can certainly support you with in terms of thinking about informed consent processes uh, and and some of the the psychological or psychosocial risks that you may want to think through um, compensation and and dual roles and obligations of clinician investigators as well um, and, and we'd love to get your your thoughts as, as well about other ways that we can support your research um, or ideas for for collaboration um, as well as the training opportunities that we may be able to develop over time uh, to get some kind of cross training between neuroethics and, and neuroscience research. Lauren, are you, I don't know if you can hear me, I'm on, on the phone, my name's Emily. Um, I was wondering if you could expand more on, I think there was one bullet point you had there about, you know, how we can you know, ethically uh, consider end of study um, considerations, but also in the framework of existing kind of uh, research infrastructure and funding. I don't know if there's been any conversations you've had with NIH thinking about, you know, I, I completely agree with the need to uh, think about end of study options. And ultimately, I mean, we ideally would love for people to keep the devices and keep using them. But these issues of when we write a grant, we have to say, well, at the end of these five years, we're going to explain everybody. That's not what we want to do. We want to say they'll keep using it. But there's a concern of, well, what will, what will happen to them? So thinking about are there other ways to have um, different kinds of funding mechanisms for long-term support or long-term care for people who have been Im implanted with different invasive devices and how we might be able to kind of change the infrastructure in favor of these, you know, policies you're recommending. 
That's that's a great question, and I, and I think at some point this may be something that that needs to be addressed in a regulatory context. Um, at, at this point, so NIH is extremely attentive to, to this issue, and I've been a part of some of the kind of multidisciplinary consensus uh, building conferences around this topic. Um, uh, NIH does require a long-term care plan as well as this neuroethical considerations plan um, in each application. And my understanding is that they're, they're, they've been a bit more expansive of, about what you can budget for longer term um, follow-up uh, compared to uh, maybe five years ago uh, within, within the budget itself. But I think there's still some unanswered questions about whether insurers should be covering some of the longer term follow-up costs. Uh, my understanding is there's variation from uh, across different insurers about what they may pay for longer term. Um, and so some of that I think needs to be addressed on a policy level uh, that's been kind of beyond the scope of what NIH has been able to control so far. Yeah, yeah so I mean, just uh, maybe address that specifically. So if you talk to uh, program officers of federal agencies, they are very much in favor of leveraging previously planned participants for future studies. Um, and I think they're coming from this method standpoint as well, that you, know, you plan somebody want to study them as long as they can, as long as you can, right? So I think they're on board with that. The problem is that doesn't fly very well from a management perspective, right? If you write a grant saying, oh, we're just going to, um, you know, if, we, if you don't address those long-term care issues, a reviewer is going to deem you, right? Whereas, you know, so I think there's also a disconnect in the review process versus what the reality is, and maybe one action item would be to be able to, you know, to Address that directly in terms of the process. I mean, it seems to be like a harder, harder sell for some people of the innovation if you are now just studying somebody that already has the device. You know, I, I so there's some of the kinds of things I, I, I see those barriers when, when I'm on study section for that. So how does, how does this that, that type of thing handle? So, for example, if somebody got BCI, for example, right, and does not want to remove it, and they don't remove it, and so then if something happens around the BCI, would insurance cover it? Th this is the unsettled question, right? So, it, you know, and there are some times when we're asked, NIH is suggesting mandates without funding. But on the one hand, you, you can't assault a person by, you know, doing battery, you know, taking it out of them without their consent. But then again, you know, the, the company and others and researchers are worried about liability. And you all don't want to, to stick the, the, pay, the subject with a huge hospital bill if something goes wrong and it breaks and somebody has to go in and fish it out or something. So it, it is, continues to be one without a good solution that people need to, to, to get set for this field to continue to so I don't agree with this, but the devil's advocate would say, like, if I bought a car, car manufacturer says, listen, I'll take care of stuff for 10 years. If you want to keep the car past 10 years, you're on your own. You're, you're assuming the liability after that. It's very clear when I buy the car that that's the case. But I, I, I get the differences here, but why is that not an argument? So so if, if your furnace has a 10-year uh, a, a warranty, but it's effective in a way that is going to send poisonous gas through your house and uh, and uh, the company will still be liable if they knowingly let you, you know, didn't warn you, you, you it's gonna be. So the, the point being that the, the car, if it were a defect that was going to substantially- Yeah, the brakes stop working. Yeah, suddenly. And, and then, then that's the kind of thing that that they still can be liable for years and years later. Gas tank was. Yeah, gas tank. The, the gas tank was great. Our part of the was the yeah. infection, right? Like, you know, across the right, right? The infection. That yeah. is. But if you inform people about that, and you say there are these risks, there are risks of taking it out, but there are also these risks of leaving it in, it's ultimately their decision, isn't it? Maybe. It requires your participation as well, and you have to make a judgment about what level of risk you're willing have your partners or participants in research undertake. It's not only their agency, right? And, and, and how much risk is unconscionable? 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 Yeah. What, what, what would be sort of legally that it would be a coercive situation that they can't help but if they're, they're never going to walk again and you say either you take this risk of dying immediately or, you know, and then we're washing your hands, you can think that 
So, so, so there's a middle ground, of course. I'm laying out extreme examples, but these are uh, uh, unsettled, but at least we need to have some plan for those kinds of conversations about what it will mean and under what circumstances we can say, buyer beware, we'll take it out now, or you're going to have to assume the risk from here on. But those conversations should start at the beginning. This is a five-year study. You know, that, that's some of the things that I think Lauren was pointing out that it's not just, we'll plan to explant it, but rather our plan will be explanted. We can't do it without your permission and recognize here are what we know about the risks. So getting those things up front so that it's not the review panel who identifies it, that I guess the more curious, I'm curious about the, the case where you recognize real risks to leaving a device in yeah. and the person refuses to take it out. What liability do I as an investigator carry at that point? And, and what structures are you going to put in place to make sure that you clearly document and convey and that they fully appreciate and have a freely choose to take on the risk as a capacity of person? Yeah. Right? So if you can't go in and get it out without a solvent, <laughs> that's a pretty big absolving, absolving condition. But but it does free you from the legwork ahead of time, which is what Paul's. Well, it doesn't it. free me from staying up late at night either. Like, <laughs> that's a, you know, yeah. an emotional toll, yes. right? Like you like you said, you're involved in these people. Yes. Yeah. And, right? and, like the and it is it is fascinating. The uh, Lauren was careful to um, put in among that in that publication not how many people showed objective demonstrable improvement. The question was how many of the people believed that they have substantial or some improvement. Yeah. Because right. uh, you know, sometimes the Y box scores in the the OCD or the AMD for the depression, you know, some of these don't show clinically significant improvements, but these subjects, the participants, partners fully believe that they are much better. Well and it's it's not entirely clear that the mere belief that you are much better isn't actually any much better. Right. Right. Um, I, I just want to two points I want to make. One addresses Balloon's point of, you know, referring to these participants as partners. I think, you know, with Ann and Ron, I'm pretty sure you can go back at some papers that Dr. Peckham wrote where Jim Jadich was the subject, but he's also one of the authors. Um, the the other point I want to make, actually two more, sorry. Um, you know, with Dr. Mortimer and Dr. Uh, Peckham's um, insistence on any grad student, maybe undergrad as well, that participates in this research, we make a lifetime commitment to these partners, right? The, the thought process in putting it in 40 years ago was that it would last the lifetime. If it didn't, maybe we were doing something wrong. We didn't realize that 20 years down the road that that becomes a significant burden. And we're dealing with that now. So a practical application, um, case grad, PhD, we went out on to uh, Stanford, started a company, was very successful with the company, had a, a little implant to treat dry eye. And he went to Australia, put it in 40 people, and it worked tremendously. Then the company changed their idea and said, we're not going to put an implant in anymore. We're going to develop a disposable, like an electric toothbrush model, where you put the electrode up your nose, push a button, and you're good to go. Well, that's a completely different implant than the 40 people had. He sold that company, but you guys might remember this. He made the company that bought it, it was Allergan, commit $2 million to support those 40 patients. He was not going to leave them alone, you know, and take his money and run. He wanted to make, because he saw the burden that this places on what we call the legacy patients and our legacy partners. Um, so that's a practical act, whether or not $2 million isn't, you know, enough. It's almost irrelevant. The fact that he thought about it, I think, is what's relevant. And the final point is for the, I don't know who's on the Zoom call, but um, for the grad students, 
I can tell you, having gone through this, you build a relationship with these research participants. It, it's unavoidable. If you're doing it right and you really care about them, you care about their schedule, you care about their health, you care about their well being, you care whether they get to you safely, get home safely. I can remember building a relationship with one particular participant in my grad student studies where we'd be at the lab late at night and I'd drive them home, take them home so I knew where we lived. We had each other's phone numbers. It was a personal relationship, like, like a partner, truly a partner, to the point where his basement flooded. Who did he call? You mean <laughs> he, called, he called me to come over and try to take care of his basement? That might be the line right there. <laughs> but it, you know, I'm, I'm both honored but kind of stunned that, oh boy, you know, what do I do when I'm not around? And the last thing I want to point out, Ron and Ann, I know it's on your minds. For our, and they touched on this in I Am Human with the lady that had the stroke. Okay, they touched on this. When you take it away or it breaks or you turn it off, our people tell us we feel paralyzed again. So they don't want you to take it away because they don't want to be paralyzed again. So I can see where it becomes a problem where the patient participant may not tell you that it's mal not that it's malfunctioning. Because if it's malfunctioning, I can still do things with it, but you may want to take it out. I don't want that, so I'm not going to tell you. That's a whole another ethical decision. So, um, what's our responsibility? Andy, you know, Andy brings up a good point. You can't do this forever on the budget that we have. Just can't. Yeah, thank you for those comments. I, I think some of the most promising directions I've heard about are, are describing public-private partnerships mm -hmm. and, and ways to develop mechanisms so that it's not the responsibility is not falling exclusively on, on researchers. I know that we're we're over time on this this Zoom call. I, I really appreciate the discussion. Um, please do contact us if you have ideas mm -hmm. about how we can collaborate most effectively. I'm happy to stick around for yeah, actually ask this one, but, you know, one quick comment and one quick question. So plug in for uh Paul Warren. They are excellent. We've submitted a new award a little over a year ago. Didn't get funded, but not because of the ethics <laughs> standpoint. That was like above and beyond, just like uh that great score. So thank you all. So on that note though, um there is a notice of special interest. From NIH for administrative supplements for research and capacity building efforts related to bioethical issues. You all are, are assuming familiar with this. And I think the way this works is that assuming that you have an NIH award already, you can write a supplement to do bioethics studies. Are you all actively engaged in this? And if you are, I'd love to talk to both of you. So, so it, it, it requires that a parent. R01 or or you or but but yeah, we we are aware of it and have been looking to see what the best fit is so we'd love to talk to you. Okay, we have an R award. <laughs> if, 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 if we have ethical questions, yeah. <laughs> seems like a good fit. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. So so you know I, I appreciate everyone's uh, work and look forward to developing you hear more about the core what we can do a variety of things. Like to uh, supplement. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 There are people in the chat. People have added yeah. to the Oh, there's me. The real solution, my recorder. The regulatory coordination. <laughs> oh, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> to protect the long term interests of the participants. Yeah. Right, like uh, if NIH approves a trial protocol, CMS has to agree to take on downstream payments in advance, for instance. Something I, I see. I don't know if that's what Megan had in mind, but for sure. Yes, thank you. Hey, why don't you get to work on that and let us know when you got it figured out? I'm on it. <laughs> okay. Give our speakers a hand. Thank, thank you. you.